welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. With us on our game day segment this week is the radio play-by-play voice of Michigan basketball, Ryan Bush, to discuss the two-week shutdown and much more. Before Brian joins us, let's start with a few of my thoughts as we always do. I knew it was too good to be true. We had made it to almost the midway point of the season without having a game canceled or even have anyone on the team test positive, as far as we know. Now all sports have been shut down for two weeks. They will be in quarantine and will not be allowed to practice or even get together. If all goes well and the medical staff gives them the all clear, all of our athletes will return to practice on February 7th and Michigan will next be in action against Illinois on the 11th. Let's hope that's how it goes. And again, we knew this might happen and it did. My guest today says even with a two week layoff, Michigan is still in the hunt for a Big Ten title. The road just got a bit harder. Michigan radio play-by-play voice Brian Bush joins me next on this week's edition of The Michigan Man, so stay with us. Here with us on our game day segment this week to talk Michigan basketball is the radio play-by-play voice of the Wolverines, Brian Bush. Brian, welcome back to the show. Uh, Thanks for having me, Mike. Glad to be here. Well, the big news, of course, uh, now that cropped up over the weekend is the two-week shutdown of Michigan athletics, and that's across the board. This sort of came out of nowhere, didn't it, Brian? Yeah, it did. and It's interesting. I mean, remember to what, you know, the the conversation was in the couple of hours before the Michigan-Purdue game, the concern about Sasha Stefanovic and his positive test and, you know, how how would that game still happen? Purdue leaning upon its protocols uh, and saying that there were no high risk uh, potential contacts with Sasha. Uh, So, you know, you feel going out of that game thinking, okay, well, hopefully, hopefully nothing happens. Hopefully everybody was indeed safe. And, and then what, 24 hours after that game ends, Mm -hmm. you find out the news. It really did, you know, come out of nowhere. Um, You know, I think it boils down to what we've talked about ever since the Big Ten reinstituted football. This was going to be a different athletic year. This is going to be a different circumstance. Uh, I I never thought that, you know, every Big Ten team would get 20 games in to its Big Ten schedule because you just assumed there were going to be some hiccups somewhere. Uh, You just hoped it wasn't going to be with Michigan. And, you know, the shame of it is Michigan was doing really well uh, in terms of not just playing games for winning games they were they you know had this Penn State game happen on Wednesday like it was supposed to they would have been caught up with their games and then boom you, you lose four of them plus that you know including that Penn State game and and you're sitting there wondering okay well can they get all these in and, and that remains to be seen obviously once they can get back but uh, you know you, you just think about the players in this spot and all they've had to go through and all the stoppages and you know you feel bad for players who have to quarantine who are doing things the right way. And, you know, by all accounts, that seems to be the, you know, both basketball programs here. Uh, we'll learn more as this shutdown continues. But uh, for now, you just you just hope that they can, you know, mentally get through what's a, a difficult time. I mean, it, sitting around in a quarantine during the middle of a basketball season, that's, that's not great for mental health. So, mm-hmm. uh, you, you know, you hope they pull through. And we've been reading there's a coalition of Michigan athletes petitioning for a reversal of the decision, and I really do feel for them, but it is highly unlikely we will get a reversal, isn't it, Brian? Yeah, I mean, from everything that I've I've heard, and, and, and I'm by no means, you know, I'm not a reporter. I'm not trying to dig in too much, but no, nah, I think this is, you know, this came from the county. This wasn't the school that, you know, instituted this. This is something that's above you know, what, you know, even Ward Manuel or, or any of his staff members can, you know, can really institute. This was this was coming from, uh, you know, a health board and from the county. Uh, Michigan has been steadfast in saying throughout this they would follow uh, medical experts through this. And, you know, that that's the step that they're following. So, um, you know, we hear an abundance of caution. That phrase is probably the phrase of 2020 and, yeah. and early here in 2021. But uh, that's just the example of it. And, you know, uh, the the one thing I'll say is, and in, in, in this is just in a vacuum only of just basketball, 
at least this didn't happen in March. You know, uh, who knows what would happen if you have to shut down for two weeks in the middle of March. I don't think the NCAA tournament is stopping for any one team. So um, here's hoping that this is the only time we have to contend with this. Well, there's been a lot written about this decision in the last few days, Brian, and bad enough you have five games wiped off your schedule, but not being able to practice for two weeks, that really does have the potential to completely uh, disrupt each of uh, these teams' rhythm, doesn't it? Yeah, that's in terms of the basketball aspect, my biggest concern. I mean, you think about what it was like. I mean, this really is, for two weeks, what the the players were enduring for two and a half, three months when they weren't allowed in any athletic uh, athletic building. You know, they can't can't go in shots up somewhere. They're supposed to be quarantined. So, you know... In in June and July, when they were just ramping back up, it was a slow process. Now they're going to sit out for two weeks and then try to come back. And, you know, right now there's a scheduled game on, on, on Thursday the 11th against Illinois. Uh, that's a tough ask. I don't care who the opponent is, especially a team like Illinois. So uh, it, it remains to be seen what, you know, what will happen in the games immediately following this pause. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly stunts any sort of momentum that Michigan did have. And, and as we know from watching them, there was plenty of momentum on the Wolverine side. Oh, absolutely. And, and as we have just mentioned, five games have been wiped off the schedule. And it will be tough enough just to uh, get restarted on the 11th of February. But is there any thought these five games are going to be made up? I would be surprised if all five got made up. Uh, there are some windows in there if you look at the schedule. Uh, the gap between, I think it's Ohio State and, and Indiana, uh, there's a six-day window there that uh, would make sense to try to get a game in. Uh, you wonder if they would try to, when, when Michigan at the very end of the schedule has a, a Thursday-Sunday set up, you wonder if they'll try to put a uh, you know a Tuesday game in there and try to play a three-game week. Um, and I, I still wonder, I still wonder if there will be a Big Ten tournament. This is I don't have any information on this. I just I just really wonder. Are you gonna Are you gonna get to a point where you know, all these teams are comfortable with, hey, you know, this team played 16 Big Ten games, this team played 18, this team played 20. Uh, do you want to use that week to, to make up games, or do you want to use that week to, to bring everybody together, you know, and, and play a tournament? So uh, that all remains to be seen. I, I'm curious how that will all play out. If they do indeed get rid of the Big Ten tournament and make up games, then I think it is feasible. Uh, but then you run into the situation where, you know, the virus isn't going to stop just because there's, you know, just because we're in March and we got to play, you know, the NCAA tournament. So uh, that's that's the big concern for me and the big question uh, looming over college basketball is what happens when there's a positive test in March? How how does the NCAA tournament handle it? How does the committee handle it proceeding? And, and once the bracket is set, what goes from there? I, I don't have those answers. You don't have those answers. I don't know if the NCAA has those answers right now, and that will be uh, – it'll be interesting. Normally normally this time of year we're talking about the bubble mm-hmm. uh, in terms of who's in or who's out. This year I think we're going to be talking about who's in and who's out from a, a COVID perspective. And, and obviously that's such a shame, but it is the nature of the beast. And you know, right now the NCAA seems you know dead set on we're going to have a tournament. It, it might look a little bit different, but we're going to have a tournament. Well, I guess uh, it is what it is at this point. We just have to uh, watch how it unfolds over the next uh, four or five weeks uh, and two months, really. So, But in the meantime, let's take some time and uh, get your thoughts on this Michigan team, Brian, at really what is midseason and some of the key players and contributors. And I guess the biggest surprise to uh, many of us has been the play of freshman center Hunter Dickinson. He has been absolutely incredible, hasn't he? We all knew he was going to have an impact, right? I mean, that was that was a gimme. We knew based on his his rankings coming in, his experience, his age for being a freshman. He's older for his his grade level uh, in college basketball, but how seamlessly he has entered into this roster, entered into this league, uh, and you, you think about how quickly he has adapted uh, to certain situations, especially coming off that loss. Uh, teams have gone from, you know, focusing elsewhere to focusing on him and his numbers have gone down. But I don't necessarily think outside of that Minnesota game that his level of play has changed all that much. He has just taken what the defense has given him. And in the first 10 games, it was it was a feast for him. They gave him one on one matchups, uh, low 
near the bucket, and he took advantage. Uh, now they're daring him to give it to somebody else to beat them. And again, outside of that one game at the barn, other players beat them. So uh, I've been really impressed. I think he's done a great job of not just producing, but also staying on the floor. I mean, you think about uh, normally with bigs, there's a huge concern in foul trouble. And really there's only been a couple of games where he's had any sort of concern uh, against Purdue. He picked up two fouls in the first half and then didn't really have the issue in the second half. There was one game, I want to say maybe it was the Oakland game, where he had four fouls late in that game and, and, and played through it. Uh, but for the most part, you haven't had to worry about that, which for a, is remarkable. I, I've been I've been blown away. You know, I think if you had to pick the best player on this team, Isaiah Livers has given him a run here in recent weeks. But, I mean, Hunter Dickens has been the guy. And, and, and what he does more than anything else to me is, yeah, he raises the ceiling a little bit, but I think he raises this team's floor even more because it, it really forces teams to pick their poison against Michigan when the Wolverines on the, are on the offensive side. Uh, and, and Michigan has two separate styles that can beat you. They can beat you from the outside, and they can beat you from the inside. And that, that's something that not a lot of teams in college basketball possess. Another player uh, is Franz Wagner, who was, you know, a little bit slow out of the gate this season, but it looks like before the stoppage, he was getting himself into a nice rhythm on both ends of the floor, Brian. Yeah, I mean, defensively is where he's really grown. Uh, and it, it seems to really pop off the screen. You know, I'm, I'm not somebody who I can't tell you the difference or pick up the difference between a guy who's in, say, the, the 50th percentile defensively and the 60th percentile <laughs> defensively. But it, I think it's pretty easy to tell when somebody's way up there on that side. And, I mean, the fact that you can make the argument that Franz Wagner is this team's best defender uh, with, with guys like Eli Brooks and Sean D. Brown Jr. on this team, that in and of itself is, is indicative of the type of progress he's made on that side. And he was a good defender last year for a freshman, but he's really taken that step. You know, and offensively, I still – I still feel like that that effective jump shooting is in his arsenal. We haven't totally seen it yet, uh, but if he can add that to his game, we've seen him grow in a lot of other areas offensively, uh, and he's already been you know mature beyond his years from that standpoint. Uh, but I think that's something to watch because he's he's been able to put up double digit points without still getting truly that going. If that can happen. Uh, look out for this young man because he's, you know, he has a chance to be a lottery pick and an impact NBA guy, uh, you know, going into next season if, if he continues that. But for now, uh, just really impressed with what he brings up both ends of the floor. And, and, and you can just tell him, mean, he, he gets it. He, he understands the work that goes into it. He understands that, you know, to your point, early in the season, he wasn't necessarily getting, you know, his, you know, quote unquote, his points, right? Mm-hmm. But it was because they weren't. They weren't the best shots. He found other guys. He, you know, he deferred, which uh, has been something that I've been impressed with with this with this entire roster. Uh, and you know, Franz, he he bit the bullet early in the season, and, and we've seen some games where he's we've seen him at the peak of his powers. Uh, and that when that happens, uh, Michigan's really tough to beat. Oh yeah, you just know that Franz Faulkner has more to give. There's uh, there's going to be uh, some good basketball we're going to get from him in the next couple of months. Another guy is Isaiah Livers. He was, you know, a little bit slow out of the yeah. gate. But as we uh, hit that stoppage, Isaiah was uh, hitting his stride, so to speak. And, you know, this team is 13-1, and one, but you've got players like Franz and Isaiah who they haven't played their best basketball yet. And this team and those guys look like they could be even better as we head down the stretch. No question about it. I mean, Isaiah, just his efficiency. You know, I... I'm impressed by Isaiah because it would have been really easy for him to come into this season and say, you know what, I need to go out and prove that I can score every night, that I can be that focal point every night in order to move up NBA draft boards. I think he really did take, you know, the the uh, analysis and the insight and the critiques from the NBA to heart, but he also merged that with what's most important for this team this season. And, you know, we've seen him, uh, go off for these, you know, I mean, he had 20 points on eight field goal attempts a couple of games ago. I mean, yeah. that, that's that's ridiculous. <laughs> that is so efficient. Uh, and yeah, it's helped by some free throws, of course. But when you're a 95% free throw shooter, yeah, you, you know, you want to make that a part of your game too because, you know, uh, those are basically gimmies at this point. So, you know, from that standpoint, 
I've just been really impressed with how he has let the let the game come to him, similar to Franz in that respect, in, in that, you know, I think Isaiah, if he really wanted to, could go out there and shoot, you know, in the teens in terms of field goal attempts every night and, and score, you know, 15 to 25 points and say, hey, look at my box score, look at my stats, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm ready for the NBA. Uh, but he hasn't done that yet. And, and, and what's been nice is he hasn't had to go out there and do that. Michigan hasn't been in a ton, a ton of spots where it's like, okay, game's tied, final minute, you know, go create a bucket, Isaiah. I think he has that capability, but he hasn't had to do that. He's let things come to him, and he has not allowed the pressure of being a senior in college basketball with real-life NBA expectations, you know, a chance to get drafted coming up this year. Uh, he hasn't let that, you know, affect the, the desire to win, and, and that, you know, more than anything else, you know, add his leadership, add his increased voice on this team. Uh, I think that most of all has been – what has been most important for him and for this team because of it. Well, one of my favorite players over the last few years has been Eli Brooks. And he just, one of those guys that does whatever he's asked to do to contribute, plays shutdown D on some of the best scorers in the conference, and in some ways uh, might be the glue of this team, Brian. No question. I think that's the perfect word for him. He is the glue guy. And, you know, it was easy to uh, look at that Minnesota loss and say, "Ah, oh, well, you know, he wasn't he wasn't out there defensively, so uh, you know, Michigan struggled to slow down Minnesota." To me, I thought that it was more noticeable on the offensive end because he just I, uh, Eli is in the right spot every time, and and that's tough to do because you know, inevitably things happen in basketball. You mm-hmm. have to adjust. You have to, you have to move around a little bit, and you know, from Eli's perspective. You know, just not having him on the floor, I think, really threw off the flow of this offense. And 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 he's stabilizer. He is that glue guy. And I'm with you, man. I I was really I was really interested in and in, you know kind of taking it back during this past off season when people were were coming up with different lineups for this team and said, oh well, Eli can come off the bench. I mean, I think Eli is so vital to this team. I think he's a you know when he's 100, percent he's a 30 plus minute a guy automatic like you can you can book that into your into your starting lineup and into your 40 you know your 40 minute game plan and you want Eli out there for 30 plus minutes every single night uh because he just he does so much and and he does it in a way similar to that Isaiah mindset of you know he doesn't have to get his necessarily I mean a perfect uh, perfect Eli Brooks night is what seven points Mm -hmm. five or six assists four rebounds a couple of steals and just, you know, and the other, you know, his, his primary defensive assignment, you know, took more shots than had points. Like, that's, that's the quintessential Eli Brooks game, and we've seen that from him more times than not this season. Well, you know, another huge question in the offseason was who would take Xavier Simpson's place, and, and then Michigan picks up a grad transfer, Mike Smith from Columbia, that I know I had never heard of. Uh, he's yeah. a different kind of point guard than Xavier was, but... He has been really one of the keys to success for this team so far this year, and he really just meshed in from the get-go, didn't he? He did. I mean, he's he's really adapted his game. You think about a guy, he averaged almost 20 shot attempts a game last season. Yeah. And that was because, I mean, his Columbia team needed it. They didn't have a whole lot. He was unquestionably their best player. But I think still he's only had one game of double-digit double digit shots this season. So he has been able to completely transform his game and, and fit as a different, differently shaped puzzle piece than he was last. last season. He was the puzzle. He was the puzzle. If you solved Mike Smith or you at least contained him, you beat Columbia. Uh, whereas now he is the piece. He is a piece of the puzzle. And you know, uh, Juwan Howard is, is somebody who he's not going to say a whole lot. He's not going to give a whole lot to the media. He's not going to use the you know his press conferences to make points. He's going to praise his players. So you kind of have to glean stuff about how he feels about players from what you see on the floor and how he utilizes them. Eli Brooks was injured and did not play against Minnesota, and Mike Smith played the first 37 minutes. Until the game was out of hand, Mike Smith was out on the floor. That right there goes to show you, and I understand that part of that is based around the absence of Eli Brooks, but you don't play a guy for 37 straight minutes if you don't implicitly trust him. And, And the fact that He's been able to do that considering the context of this offseason, considering where Mike Smith came from, the Ivy League, a one-bid league. Uh, that goes to show you right there that, that he has earned Juwan Howard's complete trust. Uh, and that right there is, is as good of a sign of, of you know 
current and future success as anything. Well, the bench play has been so solid so far through the first 14 games. Another grad transfer has been one of those reasons, a, a big reason. Brown Jr., uh, who came over from Wake Forest, he's another player who has meshed. Yeah, same concept. Maybe not as stark of a difference between his role and his previous stop at Wake Forest as, as, as Mike Smith's was at Columbia. But, I mean, this is still a guy who started pretty much every night. Uh, he was, you know, one of probably the two best players on the floor for Wake Forest. Like Mike, they didn't win very much. So uh, he's come in and embraced that, you know, 20-minute-a-night role. And, man, when he's out there on the floor, those 20 minutes are, I mean, he is running around like a madman. Mm -hmm. He is in people's face defensively. He is taking care of business on the offensive end. Uh, and he doesn't care how it happens. He just wants to produce. You know, Terry and I have talked on the broadcast, winning looks good on Sean D. Brown, as it does with Mike Smith. Uh, but you can just tell that he has he has fed off that momentum. He's fed off those victories. Uh, it's a grind when you're losing, uh, and, and especially this year. I mean, if you're losing games, you know, you, it's got to be in the back of your mind, like, is this all worth it? Is the COVID test mm-hmm. every day? Is no fans? Is is all the struggles of this worth it? You know, I mean, those are questions that Michigan players haven't had to ask in previous seasons because there's been so much success here. Well, th- that hasn't been the case for those two guys. So for them to come in here, you know, I, th- you figure they wouldn't care if there were 12,000 plus in Christ or if there were nobody. If they're winning, they're going to be happy. And you can see it translate on the floor for Sean D. Brown most of all because he just – I mean, what he brings to the table is is so much fun to watch. Well, another thing we've noticed since the season started is uh, the fact that team chemistry, it can take time to develop, and in some cases it just doesn't, even with a lot of talent on the floor. But this Michigan team seemed, from the get-go, Brian, to really play as one. And I guess if there was a, a key word I would use to describe on both ends of the floor when you watch this team, it's they're unselfish. Yeah, I mean, and you think back to the very beginning of the season for that, I, it's weird that like you look at probably Michigan's worst performance of the year, which was the which was the Oakland game. I know they didn't lose that game, but uh, that was the worst performance of the season. And you know, you, you remember Terrence Williams the second, a guy, a freshman, you know, who who's, you know now we, as we get into Big Ten play, he's not playing a ton, if at all, in, in leveraged minutes, you know, during the flow of the game. But he came in and provided such a spark in that game. And I remember being really taken aback by the bench reaction to his performance and that comeback effort. And, you know, again, considering the backdrop to this season, uh, I mean, you didn't have the normal bonding opportunities to, to hang after some conditioning, to, you know, to get to know each other by going to the movies or going, you know, or going out to eat or going bowling or something like that. They, they didn't have that opportunity. Uh, so for them to to seem in game two of the season like they had been, you know, that, that this group had known each other for, for years, not months over mm-hmm. video conferencing, uh, that was really impressive. Now, again, you know, we, we have not seen this team go through, you know, a legit stretch of adversity on the floor. We've seen plenty of adversity off the floor, floor and maybe that's why it's been easier for them to deal with, with the stuff on the floor, but... Uh, you know, this team seems to really care for one another. I think that starts at the top of the coaching staff. I think it filters down to the leaders on this team, like Isaiah Livers, uh, like Eli Brooks. You know, I think Mike Smith has taken on a bit of a leadership role. Uh, and, I mean, it's palpable. You see it. And, you know, that, that's that's important because there, there are going to be stretches this season. I don't think Michigan's going to end this year with one loss. I hope so. That'd be great. <laughs> um, but there are going to be stretches where that's going to be tested. Uh, in some high leverage games down the stretch, and, and hopefully come NCAA at the time, uh, and read the link on that. There's no doubt. Well, no one likes this two weeks uh, stretch of uh, inactivity, and I mean, no practice, nothing. But you know that chemistry facet of this team, I think, could be huge when they get back into action, Brian. Because yes, it's going to take time physically to get back into a, a rhythm, a basketball rhythm. But when you have the the great bonding and chemistry like this team has exhibited so far this year. 
you can overcome a lot, can't you? You can, and, and that's going to have to be, especially whenever they do get back to playing, they're they're going to have to lean upon that. They're going to have to lean upon their, their camaraderie, and they're going to have to lean upon some adrenaline, right? Because they won't have a whole lot in the way of, of practice before getting back into the flow of things and facing, you know, hopefully that Illinois team. The, the framework's there, and we all knew they were going some different challenges, some different issues this season, and this is just another one. And, right. and Juwan Howard has used the phrase plenty, embrace the suck. Uh, this sucks. I mean, there's no denying that this sucks. Will Michigan embrace it? I think they can. I think they will. Um, does that mean they're going to win out? No, not necessarily. Uh, but but they have the ability. I you know, I don't I don't look at this as oh well now Michigan's not the favorite in the Big Ten. I still think Michigan's the favorite in the Big Ten. Their road got more challenging. There is no doubt about that. But uh, this team is still you know eight and one in this, in this league for a reason. Uh, and, and they're still, to me, the team to beat when it comes to the conference race. Well, a final question for you, Brian, before we let you get away. How impressed are you by the job Jawan Howard has done and is doing with this program in such a very short period of time? Yeah, it's tough not to be, right? I mean, you, you think about all the unique uh, aspects of his time here. I mean, you, you think back to the very beginning, right? I mean, right. he got hired. Uh, the, the press conference was, what, May 31st, yeah. I think it was? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, so he hasn't had it normal his entire career. He got hired late. Uh, he got off to a start where he went from unranked to number four in the country. Then you lose eight of 12. Then you get back and you, you, you bounce back and you get yourself into the, you know, into the NCAA tournament. And then there isn't one. You, you cancel everything. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then you go through the off season that happens. So he, he still hasn't had a regular off season. Um, and now you're in this situation where your team's playing as well as anybody and you have to stop. So, uh, yeah, I mean, what the, the, the one thing you can take in this, and this is for the entire staff, is that since they've been together, they haven't done anything, quote-unquote, normal. So uh, they're, they're used to it. Their understanding of the challenge, and I think it comes from that directive at the top. And, um, you know, no doubt, I'm sure there's been some frustration and some hurt, uh, but once they come back, I don't think you'll, you won't hear the excuses. This team, he says it a lot, it's for competitors only. Uh, well, this team could compete. They're probably going to have to play more games than we were expecting down the stretch. Uh, but, but they'll be ready. I, I have no doubt about that. With us on our game day segment this week has been the outstanding radio play-by-play voice of Michigan basketball, Brian Bush. Brian, uh, hopefully the next time we get back together, we're talking about the stretch run, the tournament, something that involves actual games being played. So we thank you for uh, taking time uh, from your busy schedule to join us, and we look forward to that next visit very soon. Can't wait for it, Mike. We'll talk to you then, man. On Quick Hits today, Michigan has received a commitment from highly rated defensive lineman George Rooks, who announced his decision Wednesday on social media. The 6'4", 260-pound Rooks out of Jersey City St. Peter's Prep had offers from Ohio State, Penn State, and Alabama, among many others. Michigan has 20 commits in the 2021 class. Rooks is rated the number four player in New Jersey by 24-7 Sports Composite, He is the son of former Syracuse defensive lineman George Rooks Sr., a four-year starter drafted by the New York Giants. Michigan's Isaiah Livers and Michigan State's Aaron Henry are among the 10 semifinalists for the Julius Irving Award, which was announced on Wednesday. The annual honor, in its seventh year, recognizes the top small forward in the country. Livers is averaging 14.6 points, 6 rebounds, and 2.4 assists, while shooting 44.8% from three-point range and 48.9% from the field, all career best marks. It's going to be a quiet two weeks on the Michigan athletic scene, but hopefully, if all goes well, we will be back in action by February 11th. Coach Barnes Arico and the women are having a great season, and Coach Pearson's young hockey team was red hot uh, when the stoppage was announced. So if we can get all of our teams back in action, it really could be an interesting February and March on the Michigan athletic scene. That will do it for this week. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Thanks again for taking time from your busy schedule to download and listen to the show. And please tell your family and friends about us. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue.
Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!